Hi, my name is Emily Young with the San Diego Foundation. I am the Vice President of Community Impact, and we're going to spend about 15 minutes on some questions and answers that I'll, I'll ask of the panelists, and then we want to open it up. And I just want to ask, can you please give another round of applause to what a wonderful group of people doing great things in our community. So, is it better? To, I think I'll sit down. <laughs> So one of the things I wanted to ask you all um, was I was just making some notes on some common threads in terms of what are really critical factors behind the success of these things and how they take off. And I heard that it's really important to have charismatic leadership um, in a city that can really, the, the person that can really be the champion for the public and that public face of it and really get involved. I know Ron Morrison, I think you were at all four days of the, um, the Butterfly Pro uh, Park Project, Mayor Morrison, and that really made a big difference in galvanizing the public. Another thing I heard was that it's really important to have broad community engagement and to do it early and often. And that certainly really stands out for all of the things that you heard about here. And then this notion of a public and private partnership, obviously to have the support in some way of the city where you're working in a more formal way, because these are public places. And that can lead to, um, in many cases, in all the examples that you gave, really efficient, inclusive uh, creation of public places that people really embrace and they're really invested in. And they really recreate a sense of community, a sense of place. And then that citizenship culture. I thought that was really interesting. Um, a question for you all that, you know, it, we often find things that might take 40 years to create. I think of Rocco Park in, in San Diego, right in, in front of the county of San Diego office building, or other things that take a really long time to move through the process. How do you think we can apply these things that we've heard about tonight a little bit more broadly so we can have a more flexible, nimble system of revitalizing public places? And I'll just start down this way. Philip, if you want to give, give a response first. Sure. Uh, the, the courtyard project that I talked about uh, was definitely took a little bit longer to actually execute than what it normally should, especially now. Uh, that's something that we can use as a model moving forward and actually execute very quickly. Uh, like you said, you know, there's, there's an aspect of a permanent project that does take a lot longer that you do have to get you know, emotionally invested in as well as uh, financially. But I think being able to put something in temporarily and quickly and economically that very well can just act as a placeholder while you're getting ready to move forward. Uh, we did another project uh, just next to the Mission Cafe downtown, also in East Village, where we literally, we just went out there and did it. It was an empty parking lot. We got permission from the owner and we dropped in about 300 recycled pallets. We dropped in some trees. We put in some artwork. We got some local artists involved. We got the community involved and we all got out there and just, and just made it happen. Uh, sometimes you just have to do that. And Again, that's a temporary project. They're planning on putting a restaurant and stuff there, but it was just sitting vacant, so. That's yeah. great. Thank you. How about you, Matt? Yeah, I, I think it, is this on? Can everybody hear me? Uh, I think it, again, goes back to city leadership and forward-thinking leaders. I know when we opened up Butterfly Park, Mayor Morrison announced that you know, if the city did this, it would take five years and cost $500,000. You know, we did in four months for $75,000. And so I think it's working with uh, government entities. It's government, it's private, it's public, it's... Um, but we had, we had this steering group that had key stakeholders and decision makers on it. So as part of the steering group, there was a city permit, permitting guy. What do you call that guy? Just city permitting guy. Where, <laughs> <laughs> where we're trying to create these entranceways and uh, there are 16 fees. Like, well, if you need... You need a permit for 16 feet. He's like, but if you're doing 14 feet, I'm like, well, they're 14 feet now. So, I mean, it just expedites the, the process. If you include the decision makers and government and business and community together at the beginning of it, and you're all buying in together, you can shortcut a lot of the, the process. And, you know, it's easier to do in, in a community like National City because it's very conducive to it. And you've got both mayor and city council and city staff that really want to see this work done. And it's a smaller community. It gets a little more complicated when it's a larger city like San Diego, um, but we're hoping by showing what can be done at this level, it can be scalable and replicable in other communities, but it takes partnerships from everybody and everybody wanting, nobody wants to see something take five years. They want something done now. So how can you kind of cut through some of that red tape? That's right. Thank you. I agree. I mean, I think that it's amazing to imagine that- Could you speak a little bit more into all, the mic? All the, 
library parks, the transportation, the gondolas, the, the colleges and, and, and schools that were created in these slums were achieved in four years in Medellin. So it's an exemplary model of efficient, agile bureaucracy. So that's fundamental, cutting the red tape. The, the density and the opacity of our bureaucratic system here is deplorable. And I think that that needs to be advanced, and not only internal to the bureaucracy of government, but how government can become collaborative to elevate the ideas that are just emerging in communities. So this, this is a fundamental uh, aspect, I think, and that requires a highly calibrated choreography of civic coordination. So it's not just public and private, by the way, because our notion of public and private in the United States is that, yes, public and private, but the private, private ends up benefiting and the public is really ultimately undermined. This is about public, private, and communities together as well, and universities. So it's a broader spectrum of cross-sector, meaningful collaborations. So cities, cities across the US now are tackling this question by creating labs within mm -hmm. the city that you know, take direction directly from the mayor and his staff and can navigate the bureaucracy of the departments to cut through to cut through that red tape. We had an experiment like that ourselves here in San Diego. I remember that. We did. <laughs> uh, the Civic Innovation Lab in the city of San Diego was attempting to do precisely this, um, working on you know city bureaucracy while simultaneously rethinking civic engagement beyond the conventional community planning process, trying to reach new publics that had been marginalized for decades. So it's about connecting dots mm. and streamlining. Before it was defunded. Before it was defunded. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. On the one hand, it's, it's great to find these new mechanisms to really revitalize places and, and speed up the process and get the public excited and get them involved from the get-go and not have it take five years when people didn't even don't remember the meeting that they went to when that was decided. And then on the other hand, you think about you, we're creating these temporary spaces, but some of the most cherished places in San Diego, I think of Balboa Park, it's, it's in its 100th year anniversary. There's, there's kind of a tension there, right, in creating a temporary space um, that might last for six months or so, and then also really getting in the business of remaking communities for the future. Can you talk about that a little bit? Just imagining out to 2055, how do we do that, employing some of these innovative methods? Yeah, I think, um, I think again, just going off what we said earlier, I think it really comes down to collaboration. And without that, and without moving forward, both public, private, and community, I think Teddy nailed it right there in terms of if we are to move forward in 2055, I think that's something that, and I, and I really do think that San Diego, the San Diego broader area, including National City, um, really is taking a big leap forward. And I think that's something that I, I believe that the rest of the country uh, will be able to follow from. And it's, it's, it's exciting to be a part of. Yeah, I don't think it's either or. I think it's both. There's, that's not going to go away. And it's interesting because, you know, the world we've grown into is the most connected world that we've ever lived in. And it's a very small world now that we're all connected with each other, but to a big degree, we're not connected with each other. And technology is a great thing, but it's a double-edged sword. And when you build community, it's about relationships and deep relationships. So creating environments where people can meet face to face and engage with each other in meaningful ways and dialogue instead of being texting or behind the computer, that's gonna be vital to creating those environments moving forward to keep community growing and thriving and while still trying to figure out how to incorporate technology into these environments. Um, but yeah, it's just an interesting paradox where we're connected but we're not. And it, it can continue to go down a, a uh, road that maybe isn't such a great road, but I think these spaces temporary or permanent are going to be the, one of the things that save communities. I, I would say that fundamentally is about reconstructing the political itself. That we cannot advance any conversation today without really calling the problem for what it is, head on, without any fear for political liability. Meaning mm -hmm. the number one problem today, not only in the United States but everywhere else, is to confront socioeconomic inequality. And we need to call it like that. And we need to reorganize the institutions to produce a more committed project across sectors. Let's call it a new deal. Maybe that top-down public project will never come back. We need to find out ways 
to re-energize civic philanthropy around that issue, to re-energize foundations around that issue, to re-energize universities around that issue. That single-handedly was what mobilized many of these urban transformations in Latin America. And when thinking about how these spaces emerge and perform in these communities. Just speak in the mic. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. So I think Matt brought up the idea of process, that the process is as important as the product because working together builds a sense of agency and capacity in communities that may have internalized a sense of their own marginality through decades of neglect by the city and by other neighborhoods. So it's about stimulating a new sense of, of, of the possible I think, you know, in Kathleen's letter uh, online before this event, she unpacked the idea of gathering and used the metaphor of ants, or no, bees. She used the, the metaphor of the beehive. Human beings are actually bee-like, but we've come to believe that we're not. We've come to believe that we're very sort of selfish, egoistic sort of selves. But in fact, we're, we're social by nature. We're social creatures. And we need spaces that enable a new understanding of ourselves and our capacities. That's great. I'm just looking at the time. I'm, I'm going to open it up for questions now from the audience. And I, I can't really see that well. So great. We'll have people coming up here. <laughs>